Hey everybody, thanks for watching today's recording. Sorry you couldn't watch it live. Uh, Google have for some reason deleted all of our events. I still managed to do a hangout with Tim. As you can see on the screen, Tim is from a company called Think Fizz. And he's actually on a road trip at the moment and he's taken some time out. Uh, you might notice he looks like he's in a bit of a different location, but uh, it's all good. So Think Fizz uh, does a lot of work in schools around bring your own device, around game-based learning. But I guess what Tim's really well known for is his work around Minecraft in the Minecraft camps and also workshops that he runs for students. So I guess my first question for you, Tim, is uh, tell me a little bit about these uh, Minecraft camps and workshops that you're running. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here on the Sunshine Coast at the moment, and that's a green screen behind me, man. I'm not really in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've uh, the, with the Minecraft um, camps. Uh, there's two different sort of things I, I do in, um, at the moment, and one is Minecraft camps, which is sort of uh, for the kids. So on a weekend, I'll hold a, a full day event, and the kids come in, and we we have a structured Minecraft uh, session. The M Minecraft education workshops are where I PD teachers on how they can use Minecraft in their classroom to reach educational outcomes. And I should say that when I do those PDs, that I always insist that that uh, kids are actually present. And I'll, I'll get into that more a little bit later, but that, that's that's around a leadership component that I've got through all of the Minecraft stuff that I do, whether it's camps or, or workshops. Yeah, right. And so the difference between a camp and a workshop is a workshop, you bring teachers and students together and teach them, but a camp is more along the lines of like a weekend that a school will bring in and then invite students in and you'll spend a day or two with the students, is that right? Yeah, look, the, the camps don't necessarily involve uh, a school. Camps are more about kids having fun and about them starting to experience Minecraft in a more structured environment. And I introduce a lot of kids to multiplayer, which is where they're gonna to start to collaborate and behave themselves. So uh, the camps I do on weekends and in holidays, and um, the education, I do do them with and for schools during the week. However, uh, mostly they're done weekends and holidays. The education workshops are specifically so teachers can get the skill set that they need and the information they need to get started with Minecraft in their classroom and, and, or through the school. Or uh, sometimes it's actually around starting up a club. Schools want to start like that sometimes. But uh, the reason that I have kids involved is because it's for two reasons. And the first, or three actually, the first is that it grounds the teachers and I find the teachers get a much more deep sort of experience from it. It's the, the kids are great coaches. Um, you couldn't get better coaches really than that. And so, so that's of benefit to the teachers. They, they get to see the kids in action, they get to learn from the kids, but also uh, the kids get that uh, coaching and leadership skill set that come from uh, what they need to do in that role. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think you're right. Sometimes students can be the best coaches, especially for teachers and staff around technology. I think that's a that's a great thing. So tell me, how did you get into Minecraft? I'm, I'm always interested in how people come to land on a specialty. What was it about Minecraft that attracted you, I guess? <laughs> Man, it's funny. I, uh, I was working for the Department of Education in the Northern Territory, training teachers in innovative technologies. And so I'd first come across it where someone threw the idea out that, that we should trial some games-based learning focuses, foci within the Department of Education. Someone thought, I had heard of Minecraft and mentioned it. And we, so we eventually uh, got us, uh, we basically looked up the guy in Australia that knows the most about Minecraft at that time, that's Stephen Elford, who's based in Shepparton in Victoria. Um, Steve, Steve's in the school up there and does a lot of really deep work around, with middle school students around uh, Minecraft Edu. So that's when I, f I first heard of it. Uh, Steve came up and gave me some basic training in how to, to set up a server and run a server. And I helped a couple of classrooms introduce it. And it, like a lot of things in the in the department, it sort of it just didn't it didn't have the drive from say, the, the, either the leadership group in the schools or from the, the leadership within the department. So I just sort of didn't really go anywhere as far as that project went. But what got me fired up about it were a couple of different things. The first was that I, uh, my son at, at, at seven had started playing it and I hadn't taken a lot of notice. I didn't think much of it. He was trialling all sorts of different games at that age. Um, but this game he kept coming back to and he, 
he very quickly transferred from a mobile device across the computer, which he hadn't done with any other game. So I started taking notice of that. But then he called me into uh, the office one, you know, into our office area one day and said, look at what I've built. And he, he showed me this huge castle. And he, it's, if you know Minecraft, you, you, you're there 3D. So we were walking through doorways into rooms and he was explaining, this is, uh, this is your room, Dad, and look, I've put a TV on the wall and there's a fire for you to keep warm and here's the bathroom and this is where we're going to have meals. And every area, like he was able to to really describe why he had done everything. And that's when I started to ask, well, then how did you do it? Actually, no, I'll take a step back. Initially, I didn't think he'd done it. Initially, I thought he was just taking me somewhere that someone else had built or that he'd found. But then he, you know, he kept saying, Dad, I've built this. And then he showed me how, he, how he'd actually done that. And at, at that stage, I, I started to take the game seriously. What actually got me involved uh, in a business sense and, and really started to drive my, my passion and, and my work in schools was that I, was, uh, I left the Department of Education and started an education consultancy and I really wanted to do something in games-based learning, but I didn't know what. And I had listened to uh, Wes Fryer. I listened to a lot of podcasts and I was just listening to Wes Fryer, who's a fantastic educator in the States. And he, was, he had recorded this thing called a scratch cam. Scratch is a, a coding, a really basic coding sort of piece of software that, that, that is a drag and drop sort of thing so that kids can learn how to, to get started in coding. And he was holding this camp in Scratch. And what he did is he just recorded what was going on. And I could hear a, a, the noise was, was overwhelming and the, the energy was high and positive. And he was explaining to the kids. He didn't need to explain to us. He, everything that he was saying uh, to the kids was self-explanatory. This is why we're doing it. And this is what we're going to do next. And I just had a, 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 a bit of one of those moments where, light bulb moment, where I went, oh, wow, Minecraft is massively popular. And it's uh, surely it'll transfer across to the same sort of thing as what Wes is doing. So I rang a mate that was a principal of a school, and within three weeks we were running our first camp. And it was using, at that stage, Minecraft Edu with the blessing of the, the creator of that Minecraft mod. Yeah, right. So it'd be great if you could just share your screen and, and just show us some of the things yes. that you're doing around that. I, I've got a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old, and they're, they're right into Minecraft, both on computers and iPads and so on. We just bought yeah. Ben a book in the holidays, my son, who's nine, yeah. and it shows him how to yeah. construct all these things and what you need to do to create yeah, and so those on. Those Mojang books are really good value. Yeah, um, just they're... before I do take you, take you for a quick tour, there are two different sorts of, of Minecraft really, as far as teachers are concerned. The main one that teachers will use is called Minecraft Edu. And the reason I say that is that it has a graphic user interface that's really easy for teachers to, to get their heads around. So when, when we're teaching, for example, we may want to freeze everyone so that we can get some explicit information out. Um, and Minecraft Edu allows you to do that. Yeah, right. Minecraft Edu also allows you to run a group or, or, or a LAN. Uh, so you're able to network and it allows you to run that offline. Now, the reason I mention that is that schools in, I'll give you a couple of examples, schools in uh, the Northern Territory in Queensland, for example, uh, it's very difficult to convince the department to unblock a port. And Minecraft to go online needs a port open, a specific port, 25565. So, but in Victoria, now we're talking in Australia here, of course, Victoria being another state, in Victoria, it's up to the school. So if I go to Victoria, we can play online. We can join servers that are online, uh, and we can play with. We can either play online by ourselves or join other kids. Uh, it's very, very easy. In the Northern Territory and in Queensland, we simply can't do that. So Minecraft Edu becomes the only option for Minecraft because we can play it offline. Yeah, good. So I thought I'd just mention that yeah. before I show you. What I'm going to show you is uh, a server that I've created. So. As I, got, as I got my camps up and running and this Minecraft edu, education workshops, I started to see things that I wanted to have that Minecraft Edu weren't providing. I knew Minecraft Edu was going to be an awesome solution for most teachers because no one really wants to become an expert at everything. You, you want to become good at what you're, you're, you're using, but you don't need to become an expert. Minecraft Edu allows that. But I did want to become an expert in that area, so I started to study Minecraft, and I actually so I built a server that allowed me to, to have, food. for example, I don't want to have swearing on my server. I had a kid the other day that used WTF, and that was there were quite a few kids on the server that were offended by it, and that, that raised my 
it got my attention. And so what I, what I was then able to do was to go into a, a, a plugin or an area and actually type that word in. And now that word can't be used. When someone uses that word in chat in the game, the word flowers comes up instead of WTF. Oh, wow, that's so cool. I'm able to... I'm able to manipulate the game and modify the game to, to a larger extent. So I'll just uh, do a bit of a screen share now. So what you're going to see is a ser the, the server. The server is actually has 16 different worlds on it. And you can see this. I'll just have a quick look, see how many kids are on there or people. Uh, at the moment, we've got 11 kids online. So this is the hub. And this is a place that everyone comes to. And from here, those purple doorways, you can walk through and they take you to different worlds. Now, what I'm going to do now, Mike, is I'm going to take you... There's all sorts of different worlds, and I'm not going to explain them all because they're not necessarily of educational value. Or or if they are, you, uh, you, the people that are watching this can come and suss it out for themselves. I actually have four worlds that they can come and check out for free. And the thing is, if you're a teacher and I can verify you're a teacher, then I'm going to let you come in and have full access to this server. If it's because yeah, it's a great place to learn about um, Minecraft with, in, in a really safe environment, but do beware that I vet every adult that comes onto the server um, just to keep it safe. That's a good so, idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a world called Quests. We'll take I'll take you through a portal if I can remember where it is. Um, I'm going to take you to a world called Quests because Quests are like challenges, or, uh, and so here we go. This is the doorway. Challenges and quests that you can do to earn money. We have an in-game currency that allows you to improve and you know improve your inventory, improve what you've got and what you can do. So here I am in Quest World. What we've got is a, a group of different people here that, that offer us different challenges. So we've got a house designer here called the Pengu. We've got well, what she do? the carpenter, Rachi. We've got the Major's Apprentice. We've got a miner. I'm just, uh, you know, uh, we've got, a, we've got actually got someone here that's from Greening Quest Landia. So they're an environmentalist. And actually, if I click on them, I think I have to have my hands empty. So here I am in the world. This is me. Um, I'm in this world called Quest Landia. I'm going to right click on Joe, and that will allow us to. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of that chat. Actually, there you go. No, I have to get it back. Actually, so right click on Joe. And Joe said, I've got some jobs for you. I want you to either plant some trees, sow some grass, or go and get some bone meal. Now, bone meal is a, a, a natural fertilizer. So they're, they're reasonable things for an environmentalist to ask for. So I think that's going to cancel on me because I was too slow. So I'll just I'm not type in cancel. That's no, cancelled already. So right click on Joe again. And this time I'm going to choose plant trees. So I, I, whoops, I'll try type number one. And it says you may only have one quest. Give me a sec. I've obviously got a quest open, so I'll just quit it. Right click on Joe again. Press number one. And it says there, there needs to be more trees planted around the outside of the city. You want to earn some money? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I need to spell it right. And it says the quest is accepted, plant trees. So I've got to go out and first of all, I have to break 50 leaves. Now, I know as a player there's a reason for that. You might not as a new person. The reason to break leaves is to, to get them saplings so you can plant more trees. So basically, anyway, Joe's given me a quest to plant some trees. I have to go out, break some leaves, plant some trees. And once I've planted, I think it's 10 or 15 trees, I'll get a message saying, you've completed the quest, go back and see Joe. And Joe gives me a reward. So I guess the reason I want to introduce this idea to you is that the next stage of what we're going to do in this quest world is we're going to start introducing an academic factor so for example when you come into Questlandia you'll actually have you'll actually have the option to go into the art area or the the math area or the English area and you'll go up to someone like Joe and right click on them and they'll they'll give you a quest which might be um have, Mike have we got time can I give you an example of a quest yeah man go for it this is really cool yeah so one of the quests like, I'll give you two really short examples one of them would be you know, if, if it was in math it might and it depends you know it depends on how much time I've got to set this up, I guess. But let's say it's an early early childhood sort of primary, primary or elementary session, and and you want to cover uh, multiplication. So he goes and sees Joe, and Joe asks him to set up three paddocks, and each paddock needs to be seven seven meters by by eight meters, and each block represents a meter. So once you've completed those three paddocks, you go back and see Joe, and he congratulates you and gives you an in-game reward. 
then the next, because you can have stages within these quests, and the next stage of the quest could be that you then need to go and find and and put um, seven horses into each into each paddy. You then would need to represent what, when you add them all together, when you do seven times three or seven groups of three, you need to represent your answer. Now, kids can, in my mind at least, in the way I teach, kids can represent it in many, many different ways. They may do it in-game. They may actually create a book and write the answer. They may write the number 21 in blocks and then take an aerial view of it. Uh, they may write it down on a piece of paper or send me an email. I, for me, it doesn't matter how I get the answer as long as I can show that they've reached the outcome. And, and the beauty of Minecraft is that kids can take screenshots. So you'll often get them taking screenshots of the different stages it takes for them to reach their outcome. And, uh, of course, you and I being Google guys, we, we uh, encourage the kids and teachers to use, let's say, Google Sites to provide that digital evidence of their learning. Yeah, right. So I hope I'm not talking too fast, man, because I start to get pretty excited when I talk about this sort of thing. But... <laughs> The, the other thing I've done with this uh, and that I'm uh, going to introduce is, for example, if a teacher says I want a specific book and I want to have outcomes for that book and I need them to be in English and I need them to be at level uh, year five, for example, one book that I've done, uh, I've, I've worked with a teacher on in Minecraft was for them, uh, was called 27 Stellar Street. Now, someone will correct me on that, I'm sure, uh, but that's it's, it's something like that. It's a number in Stellar Street. But what we did is we got the kids to split into groups of five, and we designated an area for them in each world. And I guess in the quest world, what we do is Joe would give you the quest and say, you've read 27 Stellar Street, now go out and replicate that street with four of your classmates. So uh, you go out and you replicate that. And so the kids will, would then need to to build the street the way it, it you know the way they believed it to look from what they've read in the book. Once once that's done, then they'd come back, click on Joe, and they'd get a reward. But I think what's what's really exciting about this is Joe can then introduce a new stage where he can then ask you to go and rebuild the the street the way it will look in ten ten years time. This is a city. Now I didn't build this city. I've I found the city and I made sure that I, you know, have acknowledged the person that built it on the website that we've got. But one of the, one of the quests, you know, some some of the quests are around banking, so you can get into the economy side of things. You've got to come in here and do jobs for the banker, for example, which is what this building is. So there you go. Yeah, right. So obviously, if you're going to start from scratch, that's going to take you a fair bit of time to set all that up. Is the best way for a teacher to get involved in this? to find a server like yours or can they get on the Minecraft EDU server and there's, is there things already set up for them they can just set their uh, students not, free? There's not. That's a really good question, Mike, because most people most people that can see the engagement and, and want to tap into it, that's what their first question is, how do I go about it? And then, you know, where can I tap into it? So at the moment, as a teacher, I'd encourage you to, to find the server that's reasonably safe and a, a server that, excuse me, has other teachers on it. Mm -hmm. So my server is called the Buddyverse, and there's currently three teachers that are on here fairly, pretty much every day. We, we, we're on here because we moderate the site. There's a lot of kids that come and play here, and we want to make sure they're safe. But we also like to do teacher talk, and, and, and around that is the, you know, the, the desire for us to build an academic component into our server. So if someone wanted to come and practice here and, and have a play, that would be fine. If someone wanted to come and uh, help out and help us get that academic side set up, that would be fantastic. You know, you might as a teacher might approach me and say, Tim, I just, I actually, I can access Minecraft online and I might need a bit of help with, with getting accounts and stuff set up, but could I, use, would you be able to help me set something up that we could access online? And, and the answer to that would be yes. I'd, what I'd probably do is set up a, a separate world for your kids. And so when they go into that hub, so I'll just go back there. You know, this, whoa, going to this, going to the hub, you got all the purple doorways. We just create another purple doorway that would be, you know, if you're, uh, how we say it here in Australia, it might be 5R, so year year 5 class from Mr. Reading. Five, this might be 5R's doorway. And 5R could then come to the hub and go through this doorway, and um, you'd have a specific area that only they are able to get into and only they are able to, to build in, and the teacher can give specific guidelines. So that's how you could get started with without having to build stuff yourself. And I think that's... That's what's slowing a lot of people down is that, you know, where do you start? And if, if, you, if you left your own devices and you've, you've got to start reading up and, and build things from scratch, it can be really daunting. So with, with 
if you are going to go down that track, Minecraft Edge is the way to go. Minecraft Edge is pretty easy to set up. You do need to do a little bit of research on it. But what you'll find is that kids kids know so much about Minecraft now. They'll ask you for all sorts of things. You know, they'll ask you for mods and they'll ask you for, you know, when can I have this and when can I do that? And what, what I encourage teachers to do constantly is just to say, look, Minecraft Edu is our best bet at getting Minecraft into this school. So you're going to need to chill and accept whatever we put in front of you. Are you happy with that? And all, most kids will put their, their hand up and say, yeah, I'm really happy with that. So you just need to be aware of, of how to get that message across to kids. Otherwise, they'll, if you don't set it up like that, they'll often throw their hands up in despair and, 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 and say, like, well, this is nothing like Minecraft that I play. So if you can sort of beat them to the punch and say, this is not going to be Minecraft like what you play at home. This is going to be the educational modification and work together to make sure we can have Minecraft in our school. I think if you start like that, that's why. So yeah, Minecraft Edu is a nice, easy way to start if you're willing to do a bit of research and you're willing to make mistakes. And uh, But there is a really good and big Minecraft Edu community out there. There's a fantastic Google group, Minecraft Edu. Uh, Minecraft Edu themselves have a, a really thorough wiki. If you went to minecraftedu.com, uh, that, that's a good start. And they um, one of the benefits of Minecraft Edu is that they actually provide a server. You don't have to build it. You basically just download it and start it. And that then allows kids to join into this one world that you've created. Yeah, right. And I'm assuming, like, if, you know, students are on it, they know how to use it. I guess you could give them the responsibility of building it, in a sense. Would that come back to that leadership module, in a sense, that you could say to the students, you know, you guys need to have some level of ownership over this uh, in terms of creation, in terms of managing, and so on? Would that work as well? It would. I'd, um, I, I've, so I've tried both. Uh, when I first introduced Minecraft into a classroom, we went with a leadership model first and foremost. The, the problem with that was that there, there were some very, like, really cluey, you know, almost hacker-type kids in the, the class, and we had, to, we had to stop and start again because they got control of stuff before we knew what we were doing. <laughs> so, um, and, and, you know, most kids will be fine with that. Yeah. But we just had, had this couple of kids that were, you know, that's the way they wanted to play the game. And it spoiled it. They were spoilers that spoiled it for a lot of kids. But So what I'd do is I'd get my head around the concept. You don't have to learn that much about Minecraft. You've just got to have your head around how it works for you as an educator. How, you know, I'm, I am almost the opposite of a control freak in the classroom. But with Minecraft, you're going to need to start with, a, with some sort of control. What I've learned is that when you're, when you're using Minecraft and you don't have structure, and you don't have that form of control, there'll be tears within three minutes easily. The, the kids that the kids that have that desire to to sort of have power over others in the game will find ways to frustrate, annoy, and and what's called grief um, other kids. So if you set a structure up, and it does, it just has to be a basic sort of structure, and and the kids understand it, and they understand the game's going to be it'll be taken away if we don't you know all pull our weight. And also show them what's coming. Show them, here's the leadership model that I want to introduce. Here's where I want you guys to fit in. This is how I want you to be a part of it. It will take no time at all for you to go from that point point A to point B. But I really think as the teacher, you need to take some responsibility for knowing about the game and, and how you want it to look. That's, uh, that's going to be really good. One of the things uh, that we wanted to let everyone know as well was that in September and the beginning of October this year, we're running a conference called the Using Technology Better Conference. And the conference is going to be built around the whole concept that you pick a strand and you stick with it all day. And this is a perfect example of why we've designed a conference like this. Uh, Tim's going to be speaking at both of those conferences, the one in Sydney on the 29th and 30th of September and also in Adelaide on the 2nd and 3rd of October. But you're going to get five hours, four and a half, five hours to sit with Tim in a small group and just get this stuff sorted. So step one, right through to the end, understanding how servers work, how to avoid all the pitfalls and so on. So, uh, I mean, it's just highlighting to me once again, I'm only just at the, the slightest understanding of how this goes. You certainly pricked my interest, but I guess my initial response is, gosh, it sounds so good, but it, I, I don't know where to start. So uh, we'll put some links into the show notes. Obviously, not everyone can attend that conference. Yeah. Although I would even say to people overseas, like September is a beautiful place to be in Australia. 
and it'd be worth coming over and uh, having a week over here and spending a couple of days with us. But I guess we'll put some links into the show notes and certainly send that out in the email. But if people wanted to get hold of your server and just have a play around, what's the easiest way for them to do to be able to do that? If they just want to have a chat initially, they can email me. It's tim at thinkfizz.com.au. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty tapped into most social networks, so they can they can find me through so you know Twitter, etc. But the 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 if they know what they're doing, if they've got a Minecraft account, they can actually just jump onto the um, onto the server. It's MC. The IP address is mc.buddyburst.com. If that's gibberish, then just email me and say I I've, I heard what you were talking about. It interests <laughs> me, but I've got no idea where to start. And what I'll do is I'll help help lead you through what you need to do. Just because you'll need to get an account. I, I, I what I run is a, like a legitimate server, so there's no no um, non-paid accounts. Uh, Minecraft require you to buy a, an account for 27 Australian dollars. And so I'd need to I'd, and <clears throat> I'd need to help you get that sort of set up. And um, yeah, do go through email. That'll be the easiest way. Yeah, right. And then come and have a look at your strand at the conference. Right. That's going to be uh, it's going to be really cool. Man, I I I'm I'm really excited about the. I'm calling it UTB. I'm really excited about the UTB conference, and the reason being that I, I actually did a, um, I was at a, a Google Apps for Education summit, and I did one of those one-hour sessions on Minecraft. And I've done lots of different sessions at the the GAF summits. The the one I did on Minecraft, I, people were flowing out the doors. There was just that much interest, which I thought there would be, but it was for an hour, man. It was like, you know, it was just. It was it, all I did was pique people's interest, yeah. and uh, probably like what we're doing now, just get them interested enough so that they can ask more questions. But if we're at that UTB conference, man, we're going to drive down here. So I'm going to bring computers along. I've got 24 laptops. So anyone that wants to actually, like, the idea will be is that we'll actually we'll do some stuff in game. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show you know we're going to muck around my server because it's really cool. But we're also going to we'll fire up Minecraft Edu and we'll have a look at that because it is different and. What we'll do is we'll have a look at we'll have a look at how to get it set up, but we're also going to we're also going to uh, like plan a lesson together, and I'm also going to teach a lesson, so that they can be the students and run through it that way as well. So we're really going to drive down into it and you know ask questions all day. I think I actually think that this is going to be the optimal way of, of um, getting your head around Minecraft in education. No, I'm I'm really excited about it. I'm keen to have you along. So. Uh, that's cool. Hey, uh, obviously there's not much interaction. Normally we'd have a QA and a app going and we'd have Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and I kind of almost need to split my personality eight different ways to keep on top of all the questions that are coming through. But we've got some questions for people who filled out the form. So uh, just so that you know, every time we get you to register for this, it's because we want to be able to engage with you and be able to send you recordings and also to uh, make sure that we have the opportunity for you to ask us questions before. Uh, and so Carol in New Zealand's asked a, a couple of really good questions. And you've kind of talked about it a little bit, but I guess this one talks more around time and, and so on. So she says, how, how are teachers using Minecraft in their regular classrooms? Which we talked about that a little bit, but yeah. with a handful of computers and a limited time. So this whole concept of uh, maybe I'm not a one-to-one -one school. Uh, obviously, time is of the essence. What, what sort of strategies do you have around that? The idea, like how they're using it in a regular classroom. Most of the schools I visit um, thus far haven't been schools that have a heap of laptops or, or that a classroom can have access to. So um, some of them have computer labs, so they can have everyone on a computer. But more often than not, we actually need to pair up. I, I'm, I'm wishing for the day where we don't have to do that. And and so, so sometimes, rather than actually pair up on the computer at the same time, which is a bit old school, what we do is we'll just actually do what, what most of us modern teachers do, and we, we actually run different sessions at a time. So if, if for example, we were doing that, uh, that English component that I was talking about before, let's say we had a grade five class and we were getting them to replicate the uh, 27 Stellar Street, what we might actually do is get you know, if you've got access to five computers or six computers, get uh, and we split the kids into uh, groups of five, actually just get one group to go on and do it at a time. So that one group's doing, you know, five of them are doing their street together. And I think it's important that they, if you can, get them to work together. That collaboration in this game, until you see it for yourself, there's just no way of getting the message across. Like every time we have a teacher 
I, I have an open door policy with my camps, and I always beg teachers to come in and have a look because the moment they get in and they see how the, the, the depth to which kids or, or how deeply they're they're collaborating, how connected they are, and they work together, it's it's, it's stunning. But anyway, if you can work in small groups, that's how I do it. And, you know. How else do we do things when we've we've all got limited resources? So I'll have one. I often have one group doing perhaps a journal around it. Another group might actually be doing an animation or a claymation if we've got mobile devices. You know, I, that's how I function in the classroom anyway. Usually, and in fact, I would go so far as to say it doesn't really benefit you to have everyone online at the same time anyway. The other aspect of it. I'm sorry, Mike. Just while I'm thinking of it, we have Minecraft Edge. You. you like I said, it's not real easy to have an online component. If you were able to tap into something like my server, you can actually have kids doing work at home. And it's nuts. They'll actually they'll do way more at home than you would have would have expected. Hmm. And they'll be really they'll be humbug they'll actually humbug you at night, man, before the start of the next day for you to go in and have a look at the work they've done. That's the might be my experience with it. So that's one way to overcome your time limits, I guess, is to tap into an online environment. Yeah, right. I bet you, man. If like if a teacher had put homework for my son on Minecraft, he'd do it. No problems. <laughs> so yeah, maybe you need yeah, to just yeah. work out how to. Yeah, that'd be that'd be funny. Uh, uh, Carol also asks uh, teachers in seven and nine year olds using to motivate reluctant writers. So around oh, that yeah. writing literacy side of things, I mean, what I understand the maths and the geography and uh, and yeah. so on. What about what about writing and literacy? Yeah, there's two aspects to that that I've seen become really successful, and um, uh, the first is the first is quite naturally for them to what, what, however they're normally doing their writing in, in the classroom. If you're linking it into Minecraft, if you're so, for example, you want them to report on something they've done, or you want them to build a recipe, or list what they're going to do the next day, or create a story around. The reasons for what they did in Minecraft. So, whatever it is, whatever genre you're looking towards, just uh, you, you're, you're connecting it to Minecraft, and you'll find that alone engages them and, and, and encourages them to write more than what they may, may normally do. However, there's another aspect, and it's not handwriting. And I, I, I understand how important handwriting is to to our kids, but when it comes to literacy, you can actually create books in Minecraft, and Kids can create stories. Now, if you start doing that, you'll find that kids that don't normally write um, will go nuts, and they'll create page after page after page of writing. And in fact, what I've discovered is that I've started with kids. Um, one thing I didn't mention, Mike, is that have the amount of work I do with kids on the autism spectrum. We can go into that in more detail later or on another occasion. But I've seen kids who don't usually write that are on the spectrum that uh, start with almost complete gibberish on the page, and over time. Um, that transitions into stuff that we can actually read. No. So yeah, you can actually write. You can write books in game, and I often get them to kids to write journals, uh, just of you know what we've been doing throughout the day. I do that in camps. Yeah. They can take screenshots of the journal. So what they do is they can actually put the journal in the chest in a central location where I then can go and check on them. Oh, I never have time to do that, so I ask the kids to actually take screenshots of the pages and then deliver them to to me either through. Uh, a USB, email, or through the Google site that we've got running. Nice. There's a question coming in from Pierre's. I think that's how you pronounce his name or her name from England. Just saying uh, that they're using Minecraft in humanities, which is working really well. But oh, there's that a world of humanities? sorry, world of, world of humanities? yeah, world of humanities. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a world that was created by a teacher in Kuwait, an American teacher who's teaching in Kuwait. Yeah, right. And that world of humanities is, um, it's like, I, I haven't stayed in touch with it, but at one stage at least, it was eight different civilizations that this guy had created so that you could go and explore the Greek, um, the Greeks. You could go and exp explore the Babylonians, the Vikings. Pretty much, anyway, he had, I know he's definitely expanded on it since then, yeah, but right. it wasn't didn't just go to a piece of land where it said, we are the Greeks. He created all these different lesson plans for you to do so that your kids could go from uh, not knowing much about it through to having a really solid understanding of that particular group. 
So that's what they're referring to there. World Humanities is really awesome. Wow, there you go. See, I would never have known that. So I guess if people just go and yeah. do a Google search for it, they'll find something around it. and then, They can uh, learn more about it. It's, through, um, it's predominantly through Minecraft Edu. I haven't seen it used anywhere else, so I'm assuming that's the only place you can use it. It's it, He's done it all for free, man. So yeah, right. He's offered it out, and he continually updates it. And, yeah, look... I know that when I first saw it, all I just went, wow, that is just something I've got to have to be a part of. And then I realized that it's going to be a little bit of work. Like, you know, like most things we do, Mike, in education, you've got to do a bit of research, you've got to get your head around it. Um, and then once you do, bam, the kids will take over. Yeah, the well. kids will be asking you for, you know, which lesson are we doing next? Pierre, Pierre's was talking about the world of humanities. I'm thinking in the US, we just, I love it when people in the US stay up. And we do apologize. There was uh, Rhonda sent me an email just before we started it's one o'clock in the morning in the u.s and she stayed up and uh, wanted to be a part of the show live and then google go and delete the the thing so we apologize for that but we appreciate it so vicky uh, from the u.s also says are you going to share anything about the minecraft multiplayer app is uh do you know what the what she's talking about there yeah sort of uh it's vicky right hey vicky thanks for the question um i'm because you use the word app, Vicky, I'm assuming you mean mobile device. I've, I've definitely used uh, Minecraft on mobile devices in the classroom. Multiplayer, again, uh, if, if you haven't used it yet, Vicky, I'd encourage you to, to try it in really try it in really small groups initially because if you try and go the whole hog, if you try and go 10 kids at once, um, it, it might get away from you. So I, And I also need to, to fess up, I don't know a heck of a lot of, about it, mainly because... Um, I, I just find that the educational outcomes I can reach through a computer are just far outweigh those of a mobile, a mobile device. But I do understand that there's a lot of you who that's all you've got access to. So rip in. Get the Minecraft PE, Pocket Edition version. But have a play, have a play with it and just get some structure around it like you would anything else in your classroom. Yeah. Uh, I want to finish up with this question here. It's from Sarah in New Zealand. She says that so she's using it, and I'm just going to paraphrase the question. Basically, she said there was a lot of effort that went into playing the game as opposed to learning. She says, to be fair, their creations did show what was required, but she felt that there wasn't really much deep learning going on on the topic. And so she asked this question, which I think is a question that lots of teachers would ask. So she's going, how do you or do you need to walk that fine line between gamification for the sake of gaming and that engagement side of things and the learning. So I guess... What was her name? Uh, so Sarah. So, I mean, Sarah, yeah. is it like gaming for the I'm sake of it or is question. it learning? But you know what? It's the question. It's not a great question. It's the question. And yeah. um, I, I, look, I don't think you do need to walk a fine line. I, I think that um, I think I've, I've, it's been a really common part of what I've spoken about this, um, this session. It's structure. I mean, if you... If you go into, if, if you take your kids outside to play and you've got no structure, what happens? They run amok. Yeah. So it's exactly the same in Minecraft. If, if you're going to take kids into a Minecraft uh, environment, you need to have some structure. You need to know what outcomes you're working towards and you need the kids to understand that this is a lesson. That, that if they want free time, they're going to get it at home. Or you, you, know, you might allow some free time at school, but I, I'm not necessarily for that. I think that you use it as an educational tool. Have some structure around it. That's going to... That's going to lead away from that the play for play sake. And if you use that 27 Stella Street as an example, there was we had a that session went for two hours and we did not have not have like even one minute of free play. It was all around that lesson and the kids loved it. So the whole thing is knowing your outcome, having a, a structure, and it's not like we'll go build this and then we'll mark it at the end. But you actually have to put some yeah. some structure in place. It's same. It's isn't it the same in everything we do in education? Yeah. You know, if you just throw it out there and hope it happens. Yeah, that's really, they're the results you're going to get. So, yeah, in Minecraft, it's the same. And, and because the kids are so, so keen and, and, and so fired up and engaged, it's actually really easy. You've just got to be really strong about what it's for. This is for us to... I know you love Minecraft, and I know you want it in the school, so this is how it's going to be, and you'll be right. No, that's been really good. It's been a great discussion. To be honest, I didn't really... Like, I understand that my kids play it, but I didn't really understand the educational benefits of it. And like I've heard about it, I just haven't had the time to, to look into it, to ask the questions, to, to have those conversations. So uh, I've learned heaps. I'd, I'd love to sit through your session in Sydney or Adelaide and, and just figure it out. You're welcome to. No. Just make sure you book in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
I might just have to say cancel my strand or something and then come and visit oh, yours. Yeah. Hey, listen, if anyone wants to continue the chat, if anyone wants to uh, ask more questions or find out more, they can do it through Twitter. I'm at Wix Tim on Twitter. I've got Google Plus. Um, uh, what is it? G G plus G dot plus. I can't remember how you say it. It's G plus dot T O slash Wix. And uh, I tell you. I, Tell me what, if you want to have a look at some of the stuff that I'm doing in my camps, that'll give you an idea of, uh, it'll, it'll give you an idea of some of the leadership stuff I'm doing, some of the structure. Go to the Facebook page. It's facebookcom slash camps with an S on the end. Right. And um, that'll, yeah, yeah. And, and go down through the stream because you know I also advertise my camps there, and you might see a bit of advertising of that. Just go past that. Go past it and have a look for uh, for some of the videos that of. of the stuff that we've been doing in our camps. That Facebook page is really cool. Oh, there's one other page while you're typing stuff up, man. Yeah. There's, um, they go to schools, that's with an S, dot minecraftcamps.net. That's a site I set up initially for educators just to get, or for schools to get an idea of where Minecraft can fit in with education. It, I set that site up so that, so that schools can get an idea of how they can utilise me. But also there's a, there's a, but now look, there's a book there for download that, desperately needs revising but it's called the educator's guide to minecraft that um, myself and sean firth wrote and it's still worth a read but it desperately does need uh, uh editing so if you download it you will at some stage this year receive an email from us asking you to go and download the revised edition nice yeah okay so i've put your email up there on the screen so people can certainly shoot sure. you an email and then from there they can find you on all the social media bits and schools.minecraft.net. What was the name of that server that you said that you created? It was mc. Uh, yeah, the IP address is mc.buddyverse.com. B u d d y v e r s e. dot com. All right, done. That's that's been really good. So cool, man. yeah, so if people want to register for the conference, obviously go there, shoot Tim an email, look him up on Google Plus or on facebook or twitter or linkedin i don't know find him somewhere yeah hey listen i'm um i'm if anyone wants to catch up with me i i go to some bizarre sort of or I, I hit a lot of regional areas so this may or may not apply but i'm going to be in uh i'm in the sunshine coast this weekend next weekend i'm in Cairns in northern australia then i on, uh, the week after that i'm in um gove uh, which is in northern australia as well sort of halfway between Cairns and darwin i'm then in alice springs uh, back in Cairns. So over the next month or so, I'm sort of in the northern part of Australia. If you're from around there, feel free to give me a hoi. We might be able to touch base, have a cover. Excellent. Hey, Tim, I really appreciate your time today, mate. Uh, I appreciate you taking yeah, time out of your schedule and out of your road trip and no, stopping by. And... Time your mic. Anytime, man. In a couple of weeks' time, Blake will be back from holidays and we'll be kicking off with another session and hopefully to do, hoping to do that session around coding for kids. So keep an eye out for an email about how you can register for that one as well. But uh, until next time, have a great couple of weeks teaching uh, your students. And if there's anything we can do to help, by all means, please just shoot us an email or hit us up on social media. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time.